So I'm part of a library for web algorithmics. Uh, so what we do, we do a number of things, uh, but you might have used some of our data sets, which comprise graph, uh, like social or web graph that go from few thousand nodes to billion of nodes that are easily downloadable from our website. And we also develop a lot of software that is, I must say, quite widely used. I'm going to talk today about uh, uh, an algorithm and actually a Java implementation that we distribute and you can use uh, if you're interested in computing what I'm talking about, uh, 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 which is we have been using the last three to four years to uh, uh, analyze a number of very large graphs. Okay, so uh, what the setup is that you have a very large graph like a social graph like Facebook uh, or like a snapshot of a few billion nodes, okay? And uh, you want to understand some of these global structure. By global, I mean we are interested in computing things that depend not only on a limited neighborhood of each node of the graph, like degree distribution, okay, but something more global. Uh, initially, the reason was that it has been very clear that you can easily build models that adapt to these local properties, but as soon as you switch to more global properties, this uh, probabilistic model don't work very much. Someone before was showing that the distribution of uh, uh, the clustering coefficient does not respect theoretical model. Well, there are many other things that as you start to compute global features do not work uh, with the current models. One, for instance, is the distance distribution. So you compute the fraction of pairs of nodes at a certain distance. Distance meaning the length of the shortest path that contains them. And uh, the distributions you get from models used today don't match what we find in actually natural web graph. Of course, it's very difficult to design models that replicate the distance distribution because there are a lot of dependencies. So it's very difficult to work out in explicit form the distance distribution of uh, practically every imaginable model. Another thing that you want to understand are which are the important nodes, which is a theme going on in social sciences 60, 60 years, but here uh, we will concentrate on a, on a specific set of centralities. Now, let me insist on that uh, we, we're doing this for real. We started to do this in 2011. Uh, there is software that is part of the web bar framework. And actually, we were able to run it on the whole Facebook graph just using a, using a workstation with a 72 gigabytes of RAM. I mean, a few thousand dollar piece of equipment. And uh, you might have heard that uh, Facebook has four degrees of separation. That was us. Uh, incidentally, the New York Times uh, uh, reported uh, the distance instead of the degrees of separation that is an off by one. So when I say four degrees of separation, I'm rounding the 3.74 degrees of separation to four. I'm not a crazy Italian that rounds 474 to four, okay? But, okay, this was uh, uh, one of the use cases that showed that you can actually, on a small machine with suitable engineering and nice algorithm, you can actually analyze uh, one of the largest, well, the largest social graph uh, uh, available on a global, uh, uh, computing global features. Uh, in this talk in particular, I'm actually going to talk about geometric centralities. So geometric centralities are centralities that depend on the shortest path into a node. So you might be familiar with Bavela's closeness, which is probably the oldest explicitly defined uh, centrality ever. Who, know, who has seen closeness before? Raise your hand. Okay, a few people have seen. Okay, I explain the idea. So the idea of closeness is that you add up the distances of the other nodes to you, okay? Let's call this number peripherality. Uh, if you have a large peripherality, you're not very central. It means that a lot of nodes are very far from you. So since you want a higher score for central node, you take the reciprocal, okay? Uh, who's familiar with the average distance feature that Facebook, Facebook uh, created like two months ago or three months ago? Nobody used that. So a few months ago, a team at Facebook made it possible for you to know the denominator of that, of your particular account. You, should go, you would go to a certain page and you would have exactly, so you could know the peripherality of Zuckerman or Cell. I mean, it was very fun. I don't know if it's still on, but I mean, they, they run this kind of stuff. Okay, uh, we are actually uh, uh, very interested in graphs that are not strongly connected, like web snapshots. And uh, closeness has a number of problems because 
uh, if you want to make any meaning out of that, you just take nodes that have finite distances, but then very isolated nodes with few, with few in neighbors get a very low peripherality, so a very high centrality, and this doesn't make any sense, so we will actually, uh, we're actually more interested in harmonic centrality, which is the sum of inverse distances as opposed to one over the sum of distances. Okay, uh, the difference is just where the summation sign is, uh, but there is an enormous difference. Basically, uh, the upper thing is uh, the reciprocal of an arithmetic average. This is the reciprocal of a harmonic average, okay? And this is, works perfectly on disconnected graphs. I mean, graphs that are not strongly connected. And then also other interesting theoretical properties that I'm not going to talk about now, but uh, it behaves so much better that we try to convince people to drop the old idea. Now, just to motivate you, wh why would you ever want to compute this instead of all the nice modern stuff we have? Okay, you might know what is the Hollywood co-starship graph. is the graph that has, as nodes, anyone working in Hollywood, and there is an edge between two people if they ever worked in the same movie. Okay, it's one of the most famous intersection graphs coming out of public data. These are the first eight people by page rank on the Hollywood graph. Uh, Ron Jeremy, who knows who Ron Jeremy is? I won't say anybody you knew. Okay, nobody, okay, he's a famous porn star. Okay, okay, but even in 2016, this is a, a slide that a couple of years, but I just made the month before the computation, is still the star of Hollywood following page rank. So uh, probably a bunch of these people, we don't know them, don't want them to be there, but if you see, if you take harmonic centrality, the results are very, are much more sensible. So, I mean, different centralities highlight different aspects of networks. In this case, for instance, geometric centralities appear to work much better than uh, uh, spectral-based uh, uh, scores. So this is just to motivate you to compute uh, uh, on a large scale um, geometric centrality. Okay, so you have a large social graph, and we are interested basically, again, in two things. Knowing the distribution of distances, also to know the average distance, the degrees of separation of the network, but the distribution is much more interesting, of course, and uh, uh, computing geometric centralities. Okay, there's an intermediate step to that, uh, and this is that we will actually compute for each node an approximation of the number of nodes at distance exactly t. So the sphere or radius t around each node. And we will do that in an incremental fashion. So we will send for the computation, we will have in, a, in each counter, first the number of nodes at distance one from each node, distance two, distance three, and so on. Why? Well, of course, if you add up all of the nodes, you get exactly the distance distribution, okay? Because if I know for each node how many nodes are at distance t, and I add all over all the nodes, I get the number of pairs at distance t which is what I need to compute the distance distribution. But what is less obvious is that geometric centralities can be easily rewritten to be computed in this way. So harmonic centrality is one over this, uh, sorry, is the summation one over the distance to each node from, uh, from each node to me. But I can easily rearrange this. I can count the number of nodes at distance t and multiply this number by one over t. It's just aggregating the summation. I'm putting together all the uh, addends, one over dyx, that have a certain t at the denominator, okay? So if I can enumerate these sizes, I can compute harmonic or closeness or anything based on the neighborhood function of the nodes. So essentially, uh, Hyperbole is uh, an incremental algorithm that will let you compute for very large graph uh, the neighborhood function. So uh, the neighborhood function technically is the number of nodes in the sphere in the ball of radius t. So, uh, the number of nodes at distance at least t. And by taking difference between spheres, we will, take, uh, we will find the number of nodes at distance exactly t. But we will, we will know this number increasingly. And for instance, to compute this, we will need a float in which we will we'll accumulate this summation. So the algorithm will tell you increasingly for each t the stuff uh, between the, abs the size sign, okay? And we will accumulate this in a floating point accumulator. So this is just to convince you that uh, it's important to compute uh, the balls of radius t, the size of the balls of radius t around each node. Uh, there are many ways, of course, to do this uh, in alternate way. One is to do many breadth-first visits, maybe in a very parallel fashion and so on. Uh, for very large graphs, this is complicated because the graph must be in main memory. I mean, 
uh, the breadth-first visits uh, on disk are very slow. You can do sampling, but if your graph is not strongly connected, uh, your uh, probabilistic guarantees are actually very low. Um, and there are, uh, there, is, there are some frameworks that use sketching to get uh, very powerful information of this kind, but it doesn't scale or, paral it doesn't scale or paralyze very well, and of course, again, they need direct access. What we will do is a system by which we basically can scan in semi-streaming fashion over the list of edges of the graph. The graph will never be in main memory. This is why, we, uh, uh, I say, 100 billion nodes and beyond. With two terabytes of RAM, we will be able to do 100 million nodes because the graph will not even be in main memory. OK, an alternative approach to this is diffusion. So this is the originally in the ANF uh, uh, tool. So it is very simple. Let's BTX be the ball or radius T around X. So you have your graph, you fix X, and you take the ball or radius T around X. Now, the thing you got, must get convinced of is the ball or radius T plus one is just the union of the ball or radius T or your successors, okay? So the point here is that if you are here, and you must get to something that at distance t, you must do a first step in some direction, and then you're inside the ball of radius t minus one of this guy, because you already took a step in this direction. So I can compute incrementally the balls of radius t by simply taking the ball of radius t minus one of my neighbors and putting them together, taking the union. It's a very simple dynamic algorithm, and uh, Basically, you just need to be able to perform set unions. Um, okay, I'll quick, this should be an animated uh, feature showing how it works, but it probably take much time. But imagine, these are bit masks telling you which, be, which nodes are in your ball, and the edges represent edges in the graph. So every mask it's ord, takes the logical OR of the mask it points. So notice that each move means that basically we follow an arc in the graph, we see the source, we see the target, we or the mask of the target with the source. So we are basically streaming over the edge, and the only thing we need to be in main memory are actually these bit masks. This is the first round, you get the ball radius one. Then you restart with the ball radius one, you put them together, and you get the ball radius two, and so on. So in principle, this is very simple. Uh, the complication comes in because, uh, of course, you need quadratic space to keep this in memory, which you cannot do on the size of Facebook. So we will use approximate set, and the idea is use some very simple sketches uh, that represent um, a ball a set in such an approximate way that we can only ask for the size of the set. So it's a kind of totally degenerate dictionary. In fact, they are called probabilistic counters. But it's, more, it's simpler to think of them as uh, dictionaries that are so simple that you can only add elements and ask how many elements are in the dictionary. Okay? What, the only thing we need is that it must be easy to take the union of two dictionaries. Okay? Because this is the only operation we will do. We only do unions. So as long as we, now no matter how the representation is weird, okay, as long as we take, and take the union, we can run this process not with an explicit uh, <clears throat> Not with an explicit representation of the ball radius t, but with a very compact uh, representation. Uh, uh, okay, uh, originally people were using uh, counters needing log and element. We chose to use these hyperlog log counters by Flageolet that use just log log and space uh, uh, to, keep, uh, to keep in memory to measure a um, set of size at most n. And the nice thing is that. Uh, Martin Flagelet counters are very easy to combine. You just do the OR, as you would do with the basic thing. But we actually found some very nice Broadward, alg Broadward algorithm, which is a nice uh, word device by Knut to denote bit rolling techniques, so that with like seven or eight all logical operations, we, we can actually combine these sketches very easily. Uh, okay, just if you never seen a, so if you look for hyperlog log counter, you find billions of sites that discuss uh, data analytics because it's the workhorse of uh, uh, counting unique elements in streams. Okay, you will find a lot of references. So let me just spend a minute to tell you what is the basic idea. So uh, uh, 
The idea is that you're seeing a stream of elements and you want to put them in a set and count how large is the set. Uh, the idea is that the set will not record the elements because we don't have enough space to record the elements. We will record a combined statistical feature of the elements and we will do it in such a way that from the combined statistical feature we can get an approximation of the size of the number of unique elements we have added to the set. And the feature for hyperlog log counter is simply the number of trailing zeros of a very good hash function. Okay, so I have a counter that is empty, an element comes, I take the hash, I count the number of trailing zeros, I maximize the, the value in the counter with this value. Now, now it's clear that if you take just a single value, probably you get a not the number, so you maximize with zero. But as soon as you start to pin, put in more elements, you will start to see odd, uh, even numbers, multiple of fours, so the number you store, this maximum number of trailing zero you ever seen will go up, okay? And this is very imprecise, but basically, the number of distinct elements you've seen is proportional to two to the power of m, where m is the maximum length of the trailing zeros you ever seen. So uh, uh, again, this is like representing a set in a very, very approximate way. I have a bunch of elements, I compute the hashes of these elements, and I just memorize the longest trailing sequences of zero on the right of the hash code, okay? And I can more or less recover the number uh, from uh, two to the n. Now the point, oh, oh, uh, for some reason, this slide has a line cut out. Now notice that, okay, come down. What is the combination of two counters? It's just the maximum of the two values. So if I have a bunch of elements and the longest strip of zero I've ever seen is five, and I have another bunch of elements, and the longest strip of zero I have ever seen is three, and I put them together, the longest strip of zero I've seen in the whole set is five. It's just the maximum. So it's very easy. It's not as simple as, a, as an OR. It's an arithmetical operation, but it's very, very easy to combine uh, these counters. Okay, uh, now, when you use this kind of stuff, you don't use one counter. You use a lot of counters to reduce variance. Okay, so what we will actually do, we will have this block of memories with five bit counters packed together and we want to maximize them one by one and this is where Broadway programming comes to rescue. I mean, we can maximize very quickly these uh, rows of five bit counters. Um, so if, if you try to do that manually by pulling out the numbers, maximizing and right, you get something that is 10 times slower. So 10 times is a huge difference. Make this, uh, can make the difference between doable and not doable. Okay, now I'll scare you with this slide, which uh, uh, in my Bridget Jones-like programs I was thinking to show, but this is a nice illustration of the Broadway algorithm that I just show you as an animation and forget about it. I mean, if you're interested, it's in the paper. So basically, what happens in this algorithm that is that there is this bunch of small counters, one for each node, these counters are continuously merged together with this broad word, and as we go on, we accumulate the result. There are a number of other ideas we're using to make this fast, like we keep track of modified counter, we have a lot of parallelism. Uh, uh, I mean, clearly, each maximization is independent. So for each node, taking all the values and taking the maximum is independent. So you can assign a block of nodes to each different processor, and this thing trivially parallelizes, like embarrassingly simple to parallelize. Um, of course, then it, you're not lo any longer streaming on the edges, but you're semi streaming. I mean, basically, there is this cloud of processor that is moving packed together throughout the graph stored on disk. In a very, comp if you use memory mapping, which is every reasonable uh, uh, operating system now has, basically you can uh, access the graph like if it was direct memory and you won't see any problem, any IO problem. Because as we go through the graph, all processors act independently, but they are working in a very close region of the graph. So just to, gi uh, to give an idea of the footprint, the minimum is 20 bytes per node to do this stuff. So on a two terabyte machine, you can compute this for 100 billion nodes, which is large, okay? Um, we memorize the graphs. We use a lot of stuff we developed in the last 15 years, so the graph is compressed. For instance, Facebook was reduced to 100 gigabytes, allowed 10 bits per link. Of course, this means that when you stream over the graph, it takes one-sixth of the time if you actually wrote Facebook as a 64-bit graph, uh, I mean, uh, with the integers. 
Um, okay, we do a number of things. And just to give you an idea, okay, uh, this is one of the few things that I could try to compare to using a dupe. Uh, this is a connector graph on which I could find some uh, uh, tests to do um, closeness with a dupe. And uh, in this paper, they do this number of seconds per iteration. Hyperbon on this laptop will take 70 seconds, and on a workstation, 23 seconds. So if you have less than 100 billion nodes, I'd suggest you not to use a dupe. But then it's your choice. Um, this is another larger example on ClueWeb 09. Uh, it takes two hours to get uh, an estimation uh, of, uh, of the distance distribution and of the centralities. So it actually scales uh, very well. It's very easy to download. It's a Java program. You start from, the, from a command line. You just have to import your data. If you're interested in computing this kind of stuff, I really suggest you to try it out. Uh, a last word about the convergence. So um, as I told you, these counters come see many copies. And the more copies you have, the lower the variance. So there is a very precise uh, control about the, the relative standard deviation of the error depending on how many counters you use. So if you have even more memory, 10 terabyte, you can uh, make in one pass a more precise computation. A good question is, yeah, but when you aggregate the data, what happens? Because you're aggregating a lot of estimators. I wait for some real statistician to do the job, but uh, this is what happens in practice. So the line is the theoretical precision and what you see here, so this is the number of runs. I run the program many times and average to reduce variance. The more I run the program, the more I expect the variance to go down, okay? But what happens is that when you look at the actual precision, this is on Wikipedia, so we had exact data, okay? Uh, the precision when you aggregate the data is actually better than the predated one. So we're pretty sure that it actually works in practice. Uh, okay, uh, other things. This is a very natural fit for distributed computation. In fact, this has been re-implemented, I know at least for other implementation in the graph distributed frameworks. Um, you can apply the same idea to different size estimators as they come out. Even if hyperlog log uh, uh, estimators, probabilistic counter have some optimality property. I mean, you can do, you cannot do, you cannot do counting on n objects with less than log log n bits. There, is a, there are precise bounds. Uh, there are some new estimators by Edith Cohen, which for, for further reduce the variance. But presently, we cannot do unions. So we are waiting for someone to develop union with these new estimators. And if you're interested, the WebGraph DI Unimity is our software. And load the Unimity, you find the data sets. Thank you.